Hello everyone and welcome back to All About Steph 1 with me, Steph. Today we are talking about the American Formula 1 market and by the American market I mean specifically the market in the United States of America which has been struggling for uptake of Formula 1 for quite a few years now. In this video I'm going to be offering to diagnose what the problem is and offer some solutions so Formula 1 if you would like you are welcome to take notes. In reality, there is no one size fits all or a specific tick list that you have to go through in order to crack a market in a specific country. But in this video, I'm going to use the USA and Spain as comparisons because I think they're very similar markets in terms of the fact that they have a rich motorsport history. They are both Western economies and they've both had Formula One involvement since the very beginning with Spain hosting its first Formula One race in 1951 and the USA hosting its first Formula One race in 1950. So even though there is no specific tick list, why in the 71 years of Formula One history are we still struggling to crack into this USA market and why are we struggling to pick up fans? I would say that the formula for attempting to attack a new market would include three things. Number one being accessibility, number two being drivers and teams to root for, and number three being actual exciting and interesting racing. Now, before I get into this video, I will give 100% props to the USA, to Liberty Media and to Formula One for making these two things happen. Number one is Drive to Survive and number two is bringing Formula Three to Cota this year. In terms of Drive to Survive, I think it's definitely increased awareness of Formula One and interest in Formula One as it has made it more accessible by putting it on Netflix, which almost everyone has now. As a result, the viewership numbers for the Bahrain Grand Prix in 2021 have increased to 879,000, which is higher than any of the races throughout the entirety of 2020. The Bahrain Grand Prix ended up happening about a week after Drive to Survive dropped, so for that viewership figure to happen, it is likely linked to Drive to Survive, so I will say that that is a massive positive thing. The only negative I will say against this is that the UK viewership figures were at 2.23 million for that same Grand Prix on that same weekend. Now for the fact that the USA has a population around five times that of the UK, but the UK viewership figures are that much higher than the US ones, I think you can definitely see that there is a disparity between the two Formula One markets. But we move in baby steps and regardless of how you spin it, you can see that Drive to Survive has had a positive spin on the American Formula One market and so we'll continue to see how that will grow as a result. But now I'll move on to talk about the second reason that I am going to praise the American market at the minute and it is for allowing Formula 3 to race at Kota as one of the support races for Formula 1 this year. There are currently four Formula 3 drivers who are American. We have Juan Manuel Correa, we have Jack Crawford, Logan Sargent, and Kaylin Frederick. We do not have any American drivers in Formula 2 or Formula 1, so the fact that they've chosen Formula 3 to go and race as the support race for Formula 1 this year is definitely strategic and very, very clever. It definitely gives the Americans an opportunity to root for the drivers from the USA, which I definitely think is an important factor in the reasons why we're struggling to get uptake in viewership for Formula One. But I will specifically come on to that a little bit later. But anyway, my point still stands about it being a very, very smart decision for Formula Three to race alongside Formula One at Cota. And we will see if that will have any impact on the amount of fans that come to the circuit. COVID permitting, or the amount of viewership we potentially see over that Formula One weekend in America anyway. But now I will finally get to the point where I am talking about the shortcomings of the American Formula One market. So let me know if you agree down in the comments below on any of my points and let me know if you think there are any more further problems with the American markets as well. So in terms of accessibility in Spain, there is currently a collaboration going on between DAZN, which is a sports subscription streaming service, and Movie Star, which I think is a free-to-air channel in Spain. So this collaboration has meant that it is much more accessible and much more easy to get Spaniards involved and easy for them to be able to watch Formula One without having to pay an extortionate amount to even watch the live races. Studies have already shown that in the early races of 2021, viewership has been up in Spain, and this is not just due to the fact that Formula One is much more accessible, but it's also due to the fact that we have a Spanish Ferrari driver in Carlos Sainz Jr. and we have the return of the most successful Spanish Formula One driver in history in Fernando Alonso. In comparison to the cheaper slash free alternative that we currently have for watching Formula One in Spain, 
in the USA, it is much more expensive. So you can watch Formula One on either ESPN or F1 TV. F1 TV is going to set you back about $80 a year, which personally I think is quite reasonable in terms of the amount that you would get. So F1 TV is a pretty decent deal, but also ESPN is very expensive, I believe. The cheapest I was able to find it was with Sling TV, which I think costs about $30 for the entire year, but that doesn't even do HD. I think it's very, very complicated in finding a way to watch Formula One in the USA, and it's clearly a lot more expensive than it currently is in Spain. Formula One being behind a paywall is completely understandable because it is a very expensive sport, but it's definitely alienating this United States market at the minute by being so extortionately expensive. And I think Formula One needs to realize that the viewership would be massively increased if it was on a free to air channel and would definitely entice a few more Americans to come and try Formula One. Another thing that we don't really talk about in terms of accessibility is the times that the racing is on at. So usually the racing is very, very early in the morning for the Americans. So if we have a European race that starts at 2 p.m. UK time, then that's 6 a.m. Pacific time for the Americans. Now, if you have three, four months of racing in Europe in which every single race you have to wake up at 6 a.m. to watch, I think you would quickly turn off a of Formula One. If we look at IndyCar and NASCAR, which I will probably keep referring to in this video because they are iconic motorsports in America, they are on at reasonable times for the American audience. Changing the race times is not necessarily something that can be altered massively because we do have to have a certain amount of visibility and light for the races to go ahead, but potentially even pushing the European races an hour forward would give the Americans a little bit more time to get up, get ready and actually tune into the Formula One. Accessibility is a massive problem that we have throughout Formula One anyway, and America, the United States, is not necessarily a place that suffers with this alone. There are a lot of countries around the world in which it is too expensive to watch Formula One, and therefore it is alienating a large portion of the fan base. But that is something that Formula One needs to directly look at, and it's not solely a problem that the United States suffers with. Now the next point is actually something that I think is very applicable to the United States and Spain and it is the fact that they are both very patriotic nations and therefore need drivers and teams to support. I'm not going to pretend that Formula One didn't exist in Spain before Fernando Alonso arrived and was incredibly dominant but the popularity of Formula One definitely increased when Fernando Alonso entered the sport. A Spanish study showed that Fernando Alonso was actually the most recognisable sportsman among the Spanish people, even ahead of Rafael Nadal, Leo Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, who all had a 98% recognition rating, while Fernando Alonso had a 99% recognition rating. And so Fernando Alonso can definitely be credited, not necessarily with popularising the sport, but with definitely bringing it to a more national audience. Like I mentioned as well, we do have the Spanish Ferrari driver of Carlos Sainz in 2021. The last Spanish Ferrari driver was Fernando Alonso, who is a two-time Formula One world champion. So I think a lot of Spain is placing a lot of hope in Carlos Sainz Jr. as well and expecting him to produce some really good results. It's really easy to root for somebody who is from your hometown and we as Britons, I don't really think we have this in Formula One, we don't necessarily root for the British driver. You know, I could go down and ask somebody down the street who they love in Formula One and they could say Sebastian Vettel and I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever because in the UK we just don't have that same patriotism in supporting our own drivers that somewhere like Spain does. And I think that this is where the United States market also falls a little bit short. There have been a lot of drivers from the United States throughout history that have participated in Formula One, but the majority of these drivers only participated in the Indy 500, which did technically count as a Formula One World Championship race, and they didn't participate in many of the other races outside of the United States. Which begs the question, how much can you actually say that they were part of Formula One, or were they just part of the Indy 500? And that side of American motorsport. We did have the United States driver Alexander Rossi in for a couple of races in 2015, but besides that, it's been many years since we've had a proper United States Formula One driver, and this is definitely a barrier to the American audience because they don't see the American drivers on their screen. In comparison to IndyCar, where 12 of the 34 full-time drivers are American, 
this is a massive downgrade and we just don't have sufficient drivers from the United States in Formula One to pique the American's interest. The same issue is found with teams as well. It could have been a really positive thing that Haas came into Formula One in 2016 because that was the first American team since 1986. And I think it would have been extremely successful had Haas been a successful team. I could probably bet my life savings that if Haas were competitive and competing for the world championship this year, that the American interest in Formula One would have completely skyrocketed. Unfortunately, no one wants to see a team that is supposedly representing you being so far at the back of the grid and so uncompetitive. So I think that that's definitely deterring a lot of Americans from supporting Haas and from watching Formula One as religiously as the Europeans potentially do. And thirdly, if we start talking about whether the races are interesting, whether they're exciting in these countries, I think in Spain we can definitely take that off. I mean, 1996 with Michael Schumacher winning in the wet, 2006 with Fernando Alonso taking a victory on home turf, and 2016 with Max Verstappen taking his maiden victory for Red Bull on his debut for the team. Even though Spain is not necessarily known for the most exciting races, there are still some incredible ones that have happened throughout history that we can definitely remember, and the same can be said for the USA as well. Dallas, 1984, when Mansell ended up collapsing while pushing his car to the end of the finish line. Kimi Raikkonen, 2018, taking that final win for Ferrari and his first win in over five years. The point is there are some exceptional races in Formula One history and because Spain and the USA have both been on the calendar for an extremely long period of time, at least 70 years each, they have had some incredible races and we've been to several different tracks, especially in the USA. Watkins Glen, Indianapolis Speedway, we're off to Miami, we've been to Cota, Detroit. There have been a lot of races in the USA, but why have we had so many at so many different tracks? Taking the comparison, not from Spain this time, but from the UK, we haven't always raced at Silverstone, but it's the one that we keep coming back to because Formula One has so much history in that one race and it's such a brilliant race that no one would ever think of taking it off the calendar anymore whereas if you look to america you can't think of a specific iconic racetrack that you could not imagine hosting the usa grand prix and this is where i will point out that the best chance for the usa to increase its formula one market would be to go back to the indianapolis motor speedway and it is because the usa citizens and the residents and the motorsport fans already have a massive connection with this racetrack because IndyCar and NASCAR both race there. I think the Indianapolis Speedway is viewed very similarly to the way Silverstone is viewed by UK fans as the optimum track and you know the iconic one that everyone knows and nobody will ever forget. It's all well and good building a new racetrack in Kota, which is a very successful racetrack, and it's all well and good saying that you're going to go to Miami, but Miami currently does not have any symbolism with motorsport right now, so there is almost no reason for Formula 1 to have just randomly said we're going to go to Miami. Holding a race at the Indianapolis Speedway over Miami would kill two birds with one stone, because you are already raising awareness of Formula 1 by racing at the most iconic circuit in the usa but you're also managing to bridge the gap between those motorsport lovers who love indycar and nascar and the ones who might want to watch formula one finally to conclude we are going to talk about grassroots projects because i genuinely believe that these are the solution to 90 percent of formula one's problems right now grassroots schemes trying to get young carters and young racers into formula one from america would do the world of good for the american f1 market the fact that if you want to join karting or if you want to have a hope of a Formula One career, you do have to move to Europe is a fact that is inescapable for anyone who lives outside of Europe. Personally, I feel that all of Formula One's decisions in terms of trying to crack and tackle this F1 market in America, all of the decisions have been very, very short term. And I think that that is why over the 71 years of Formula One history, we don't have that consistent Formula One market in the USA like we probably should have. In reality, going to Miami is not a quick fix and it's not going to create a sudden market for Formula One. That is not the answer. Obviously, me saying that I think we should have an American F1 driver is not going to magically create an F1 driver and it might not be the only thing that is going to increase viewership in the USA. But it's something that I think is really important and that Formula One is missing out on right now.
But regardless, I think this is a really interesting topic and I'm very much excited to see if the Miami GP and COTA in 2022 will actually increase the amount of people that watch Formula One and increase kind of the interest around the USA market. But yeah, I think I've talked your ears off enough for this video, but comment down below if you think that there's anything else missing in the Formula One market for America and any suggestions that you have for Formula One just in case they are watching this video. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe down below if you have not already. But thank you all so much for watching again and I will see you in the next one. Bye!